So if you've been riding the information superhighways lately, you may have noticed stories like these. Drinking a glass of milk a day can cut heart disease risks as study. Dairy milk may lower cholesterol and reduce coronary heart disease risk. Milk consumption not linked to cardiometabolic diseases concludes large-scale meta-study, etc, etc. Long-time viewers may be getting some pretty strong deja vu right about now, because this will be the third time I've examined claims almost identical to these on my channel, and so far I am batting a thousand. Though maybe playing whack-a-mole would be a more suitable analogy, because as soon as one story like this enters the news cycle and gets debunked, another pops up to take its place, and then another and another. There seems to be no end to it. Anyway, let's take a look at what's being claimed this time. Couldn't hurt, right? So basically there are two types of news coverage regarding this study. Uh, the poor coverage, which makes hyperbolic statements which go far beyond what the researchers ever claim, and the fair-ish coverage, where the journalists for the most part simply reproduce the researchers' claims. Uh, you'll notice there's no third category, no good coverage, that which closely examines and or critiques the author's claims. But then again, if there were, I'd be out of a job, so every cloud, I guess? So let's take a look at an example of the bad coverage. This is from the Metro, and I have it on good authority that there is a news story hiding somewhere within these ads. Ah yes, here it is. A recent study has found that enjoying a glass of milk every day is very good for your heart health. Yeah, the authors of the scientific paper never actually talk about a serving size of a glass of milk per day. By the way, the newspaper basically took it upon themselves to invent this recommended serving size so that every reader can take immediate action in adjusting their diet. Isn't that thoughtful? Published earlier this week in the International Journal of Obesity, the study followed 2 million people from the UK and US and singled out those who consumed higher levels of the white stuff. Yeah, this is also a little misleading. I mean, the researchers actually just used the data from a bunch of existing studies, so there's really no following around of people. Results showed that regular milk drinkers who consumed at least one glass a day, that again, had a 14% lower risk of coronary heart disease. We'll get into this claim a bit later, but you get the picture, right? I mean, milk good for heart. So let's take a look at some fair-ish coverage. Uh, this one's from Medical News Today. A new study suggests that drinking dairy milk may lower cholesterol levels. Notice that they're using qualifiers here, like suggests and may. They get some brownie points for that. The scientists found that even though drinking milk leads to higher body mass index and body fat, it still lowers the risk of coronary heart disease. So they're putting some caveats to the milk is healthy narrative front and center, but they're no longer using the qualifiers like suggests and may or associated with when talking about the lowered risk of coronary heart disease. So, you know, swings and roundabouts, but you can't have everything. After all, I suspect we are approaching the limits of what can be expected from overworked and underpaid journalists. I mean, it took me a few days of intensive research to get a handle on the study and others like it. I'm guessing most journalists are working to deadlines of mere hours. So it's probably a good idea if I take it from here and tell you about the study myself. The results cited in the press come from what's known as a Mendelian randomization study. Now, in standard epidemiology, you look for correlations between a modifiable exposure, such as C-reactive protein levels in the blood, and an outcome, like cardiovascular disease, CVD. Then you can say stuff like, hey, the people with higher levels of C-reactive protein in their blood have more cardiovascular disease. You might then make the mistake of thinking C-reactive protein causes cardiovascular diseases. Uh, you might even go ahead and make a drug that lowers C-reactive protein levels in order to treat or prevent CVD. The problem is that the correlation between the exposure and the outcome doesn't mean that the former is causing the latter because of pesky confounding factors. For example, smoking may increase one's risk of CVDs through other mechanisms and also increase levels of C-reactive proteins, hence the correlation, but also hence why correlation doesn't necessarily equal causation, as this famous graphic neatly demonstrates. The other problem you face in traditional epidemiology is what's known as reverse causation. So sticking with our earlier example, C-reactive protein is produced in your liver in response to inflammation. Now atherosclerosis is an inflammatory condition and as such it would increase your blood levels of C-reactive protein. So again, looking at the population you'd see the correlation between higher levels of C-reactive protein and CVD incidence and you might wrongly infer that it's the C-reactive protein causing the CVD when in fact the reverse is true.
Enter Mendelian randomization. This is where you find some genetic trait to act as an instrumental variable. That's basically a stand-in for the modifiable exposure. For example, say there's a gene mutation that causes people to have higher levels of C-reactive protein. You could then see if people with that genetic trait are more likely to get cardiovascular disease. This way you eliminate the problem of reverse causality since cardiovascular disease can't determine what your genes are. You know, your genes are randomized during conception, hence Mendelian randomization. Similarly, most confounding factors can usually be expected to be eliminated in this way because they too would be randomized throughout the population. In other words, you could expect roughly the same number of smokers, for example, to have the gene as not have the gene. So any observable average differences between the population of the gene variant carriers and the non-variant carriers in terms of cardiovascular disease incidence would not be attributable to confounding factors like smoking. So basically, Mendelian randomization is a pretty neat tool that helps researchers avoid many of the pitfalls of traditional epidemiology. But like any methodology, it also has its limitations, and in this case, its validity rests on three main assumptions. Firstly, that the instrumental variable is actually associated with the modifiable exposure. This is also known as the relevance assumption. <laughs> Secondly, that it has no direct effect on the outcome, the independence assumption. And thirdly, that it has no effect on the outcome except via the exposure. There, that there are no other intermediary factors at play, and this is called the exclusion restriction assumption. Now, for the study in question, the one that's been making the rounds with the press, the researchers wanted to examine correlations between milk consumption and various cardiometabolic traits such as BMI and cholesterol levels, as well as cardiovascular disease incidence itself. But being a Mendelian randomization study, they decided to use a genetic variant as a stand-in for milk consumption, and hence sidestep the influences of potential confounders such as socioeconomic status, education and exercise, etc. So they'd be more confident in inferring causality based on these correlations. So, the genetic variant in question was a functional single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP, associated with the Eurasian lactase persistence, or LCT gene. So, milk contains a sugar called lactose, and you need an enzyme called lactase to break it down and digest it. Now, in most of the world, infants produce the lactase enzyme to break down the lactose in their mother's milk, but they naturally stop producing it as they get a little bit older. And because they no longer produce it, they can no longer digest lactose, and so breastfeeding in adulthood, whether from their mother or another species, doesn't work out so well. The lactose sugars will pass through the intestines without being broken down and absorbed, and bacteria will feed on those sugars in the colon, giving you stomach cramps and diarrhea, etc. This is what we term lactose malabsorption, or lactose intolerance, where it's symptomatic. But many people of Northern European ancestry have this genetic variant called SNPRS4988235, which means your body will keep producing the lactase enzyme well into adulthood, hence why it's known as the lactase persistence genetic variant. And basically we know from large-scale studies which take oral swabs or blood samples from people in order to analyze their genomes, as well as have them answer quick questionnaires about their dietary intake, that people with this genetic variant tend to drink more milk. Big shocker, right? People who get diarrhea when drinking milk tend to drink less milk, and people who don't get diarrhea drink more. So this genetic variant obviously satisfies the first assumption that all Mendelian randomization studies are resting upon, i.e. the fact that the genetic trait is actually associated with the modifiable exposure of interest, in this case milk consumption. So this was the first thing that struck me about the studies reporting in the press, and that is even if you accept all the findings at face value, None of the news articles seem to point out that the results could only ever apply to you if you have the genetic variant for lactase persistence, because people who don't could obviously expect to experience very different health outcomes from milk consumption. So let's get into the study's findings. Essentially, people with the genetic variant, which remember is being used as a proxy for higher milk consumption, were found to have, on average, lower levels of bad cholesterol, lower levels of good cholesterol, higher body mass index, lower levels of coronary artery disease, and higher body fat percentage. So in terms of biomarkers for chronic disease, it's obviously a bit of a mixed bag. So again, it was a bit odd that although most news stories did mention that these negative effects were correlated with the milk chugging genetic variant, the main thrust of the stories was always milk is healthy, with maybe a little caveat somewhere towards the end about the weight and fat gain. So why is this the case? Why is every headline milk lowers cholesterol or milk helps heart health? Where's my milk makes you fat headline? But to be fair, the chosen focus is probably attributable to the fact that biomarkers aside, when it came to disease incidence itself, the lactase persistence variant was associated with a lower incidence of coronary artery disease. So let's talk about that, shall we? 
As we see from this table, the odds ratio of getting coronary artery disease was 0.86 for those with the lactase persistence genetic variant, hence the 14% lower chance figures quoted in the press. But ignoring type 2 diabetes, because the authors don't really make any claims about that since the evidence is conflicting, if we look elsewhere in this table to cardiovascular disease, we see very little change. In fact, if we look at the confidence interval, the authors can't even be sure which way the pendulum swings, more or less risk. Now, this is important because cardiovascular disease is an umbrella term that encompasses many different conditions, of which coronary artery disease is one. So, if the lactase persistence genetic variant isn't associated with a reduction in CVDs as a whole, but it is associated with a reduction in one specific CVD, namely coronary artery disease, then there must be other forms of CVD, like stroke or peripheral artery disease, for which the genetic persistence variant is actually associated with a higher incidence in order to for it to balance out. So where are these other counterbalancing cardiovascular diseases on our chart? Forget milk makes you fat. Where's my milk increases risk of stroke headline or milk consumption associated with peripheral artery disease? This is staggeringly irresponsible because the study found an essentially neutral association between the instrumental variable for milk consumption and cardiovascular disease incidence overall, yet the core message across all the news coverage is that milk is good for your cardiovascular health because of a reduced incidence of one specific cardiovascular disease. Trading one cardiovascular disease for another whilst gaining weight is not what I'd call a smart health choice. But before we get too ahead of ourselves, I'd argue that this study's results shouldn't be taken all too seriously anyway. I mean, ultimately the study flags correlations. And whilst the purpose of Mendelian randomization is to eliminate as many confounders as possible so that you can be more confident about making causal inferences based on these correlations, due to the study's design, there are plenty of potentially confounding factors that remain very much in play. As you may recall, one of the fundamental assumptions that must hold true for anything to serve as an instrumental variable for a modifiable exposure is that the instrumental variable has no effect on the outcome except via the exposure. So the problem with using a genetic variance as an instrumental variable as a proxy for a complex behavior like milk consumption is that milk consumption doesn't occur in isolation. It is inextricably linked to certain other dietary practices principally through paired food consumption and substituted foods. So taking paired food consumption first, people who consume more milk do so in a given context. You have to ask, how are they consuming that milk? And hence, it could be the case that those who consume more milk do so in their tea or in their morning cereal, for example. Now, these behaviors are linked to the milk consumption itself, so the use of an instrumental variable doesn't help eliminate their confounding influence. These potentially closely associated differences in dietary behavior could not be expected to be randomized between carriers of the lactase persistence genetic variant and non-carriers. In being linked culturally and behaviorally to milk consumption itself, these commonly paired dietary intakes, like the milk consumption, would be expected to be more prevalent amongst the carriers of the genetic variant. In other words, how do we know it's not the whole grains in their morning cereal that's protecting these people against coronary artery disease, or indeed, their habitual tea drinking? These common milk consumption pairings have both been independently associated with a lower risk of CVD incidence or lower CVD-related biomarkers. You could also potentially have the opposite problem with displaced foods. Are people who consume less cow's milk getting more heart disease because they're replacing it with something which could be potentially more harmful, perhaps something like coconut milk? This substitution effect may be especially significant when you consider that the study data comes from people born in the 1950s and the 1960s. For people born around this time, varying levels of milk consumption could be expected to have very different health outcomes when compared to those same variations in consumption for people born today. Today, less milk from cows might mean more oat milk, more almond milk or soy milk, products that were rarely seen in supermarkets even 10 years ago. So we really can't use data about the health effects of varying levels of cow's milk consumption on people living between the late 1950s and the early 2000s and expect those health effects to translate to the consequences of modern day dietary choices. But even if we ignore the potential confounding effects of foods and beverages which are commonly paired with or substituted for cow's milk, even if we could somehow be sure that the reduced risk of coronary artery disease was attributable to the milk itself, this kind of study couldn't tell us what aspect or aspects of milk consumption were responsible for the reduced risk. 
This information is important if we want to make health-based dietary decisions. If, for example, we knew that it was the calcium in milk that reduced coronary artery disease risk, then we could gain the protective effects in other ways, such as eating leafy green vegetables, which wouldn't also have the side effect of the weight and fat gain associated with milk consumption. Taking that one step further, even if we were sure that milk consumption was responsible for a reduced risk of coronary artery disease, and, you know, for whatever reason we didn't care about a stepwise increase in the risk of other cardiovascular diseases like stroke, we couldn't be sure that the protective effects regards coronary artery disease were due to the inherent properties of milk. It could be due to the fact that vitamin D is added to milk. Again, this is perfectly plausible because vitamin D is believed to play an important role in cardiovascular health. This is why we need randomized controlled trials to really get to the bottom of these relationships. Indeed, the authors of the study even admit as much, and I quote, large intervention trials are needed to establish the causal link between high milk consumption and cardiometabolic phenotypes before changes in dairy consumption could be recommended for the prevention of cardiometabolic traits. But that hasn't stopped the news media from doling out their own dairy consumption recommendations. I mean, even if they're not explicitly framed as such, you can of course expect these stories to have a direct influence on consumer behaviours, especially amongst those at increased risk of cardiovascular disease. This is extremely irresponsible journalism. But I'd suggest the researchers are equally to blame. I'd imagine that not including the data for other cardiovascular disease incidences like stroke and peripheral artery disease was a calculated move, calculated to give their findings a stronger narrative. I mean, the idea that milk consumption is associated with cardiovascular health benefits was always going to play better in the press than something convoluted like milk consumption was associated with a decreased incidence of coronary artery disease but an increased incidence of stroke and or peripheral artery disease. Oh, and by the way, only randomized control trials can tell us what is really going on. No, the media likes a simple narrative and they like to tell people what they want to hear. And it seems to me that the researchers plan to cater to these proclivities almost from the start. Thanks for watching. If you think my work is valuable and you'd like to help support me in my continued efforts to expose misinformation like this, please consider supporting me on Patreon so that I can sustainably do this full time. You've been watching Veganism Unspun, I've been David, and remember, sharks can detect a single drop of ice cream on your lips from over a mile away, so stay out of the water. <laughs>